Hi guys, it's Quinn here. If you enjoy my videos, consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm really notices me. The Remembrance of Earth's Past Trilogy is one of the best sets of speculative science fiction books to appear in recent years. The trilogy explores themes surrounding both the human will to survive and the potential of mankind to inflict harm upon itself rather than band together in the face of a greater threat. Another major theme is our place in the universe and assumptions about the cosmos and our lack of actual concrete knowledge about it. Because of its exploration of these themes, The Remembrance of Earth's Past is one of the most existentially terrifying series of the modern era in my opinion. I've covered several aspects of this series in videos that can be found linked in the playlist below. In this video specifically, we will discuss the ending of the final book in the trilogy, Death's End. This video will have spoilers for all three books in the series, so keep that in mind. The star DX3906 had been gifted to Shang Xin during the Crisis Era by a man named Tian Ming. Tian Ming would go on to be the only human being ever to make physical contact with the alien beings known as the Tricelerans who had attempted to invade Earth and claim the planet for their own. With the help of Tian Ming's brain, the aliens devised an attack on humankind, lulling humankind into a false sense of security. The alien strike nearly destroying all of mankind. When the hour has grown late and all hope seems lost, the inhabitants of the vessels Blue Space and Gravity, who had left the human solar system long before this time, triggered a gravitational wave transmitter, revealing both the location of Earth and the location of the homeworld of the Trisolarans. As we have discussed in detail in other videos, in this universe, the revelation of one's location is deadly due to the hostile nature of cosmic society. Trisolaris is quickly destroyed, and eventually Earth's own solar system is flattened into two dimensions. Shang Xin and AA are the only inhabitants of the solar system to escape. By the time they reach Planet Blue, hundreds of years have passed from the perspective of Earth due to the effects of relativity. Shang Xin and AA find Guan Yi Fan, a former inhabitant of blue space and gravity on the world. He had only been woken from hibernation a few years earlier. From him they learn that mankind has expanded during the years of Shang Xin and AA's travel through the vacuum of space. I've also discussed this in detail in past videos. Guan Yi Fan is ultimately the one who teaches Shang Xin about death lines, which were left as the result of curvature propulsion, a method of faster than light travel. Within a death line, the speed of light could reach zero. Nothing could move within a death line. After returning to Planet Blue after investigating signals from the other world in the system, Planet Grey, Guan Yi Fan and Shang Xin receive a transmission from AA down on the surface of Planet Blue. She informs them that Tian Ming has returned. AA's voice was agitated. I've called you multiple times, and the ship's AI refused to wake you. I told you we have to maintain radio silence. What happened? Young Tian Ming is here. Shang Xin was thunderstruck. The last traces of sleep left her, and even Yi Fan's jaw hung open. Shang Xin and Guan Yi Fan enter the shuttle to pilot down to Planet Blue, but before they can, something goes horribly wrong. Shang Xin experiences then the effects of being inside of a time vacuum. The moment seemed to be infinitely short and infinitely long. She got the feeling that she was outside of time, but also stepping across it. In a time vacuum, the length of time in that moment cannot be measured, because within a time vacuum, time does not exist. At the same time, she felt herself collapse, as though she was going to turn into a singularity. Meanwhile, the mass of her, Guan Yi Fan, and the shuttle approached infinity, and then everything plunged into darkness. The death lines, which Shang Xin and Guan Yi Fan had discovered leading from Planet Grey, had ruptured, seemingly due to interference from Tian Ming's ship. Because of this, they expanded to cover the entire solar system. The shuttle and Guan Yi Fan's ship, Hunter, were now orbiting Planet Blue at light speed, except light speed in this region was now less than 20 kilometers per second. Shang Xin and Guan Yi Fan were trapped 
Without the computer systems, Hunter and the shuttle could not decelerate. Sheng Xin didn't want to ask what their next step was, knowing that nothing more could be done. No computer could operate when the speed of light was below 20 kilometers per second. The shuttle's AI and control systems were all dead. Under such conditions, not even a light inside the spacecraft could be turned on. It was just a metal with no electricity or power. Humans at this point in history had prepared for the potential of drifting into the trails of light speed ships. This was why both the shuttle and the larger vessel possessed a secondary system based on neural computers. Such systems were based on the brains of intelligent animals and could operate in reduced light speed environments. The key isn't the speed of light, but the system design. The transmission of chemical signals in the brain is even slower, only two or three meters per second, not much faster than us walking. Neural computers can still work because they imitate the highly parallel processing found in the brains of higher animals. All the chips are designed specifically to function under reduced light speed conditions. The neural systems on both the shuttle and the larger ship would take about 12 days to boot. This process was extremely slow due to the rate of serial data transmission under reduced light speed. They both would have to enter a short term form of hibernation. They now orbited the planet blue at light speed, and though light speed for them was reduced within the rupture death line, time still moved much faster on the outside. Can you see the patterns on the belt repeating periodically? Yifan wasn't looking outside at all. His eyes were half closed as he strapped himself into the hypergravity seat. They're moving too fast. Try to follow the motion with your eyes. Sheng Xin tried to match her moving gaze with the patterns flowing across the belt. For a moment, she could see the blue, white, and yellow patches. They blurred almost immediately. I can't, she said. That's all right. They're moving too fast. The pattern could be repeating several hundred times per second. Yifan sighed. Sheng Xin noticed his sorrow, despite his effort to hide it, and she knew why. She understood that every time the pattern repeated on the broad belt, it meant that the shuttle had completed another orbit around Planet Blue at light speed. Even at reduced light speed, the demonic rules of the theory of special relativity still held. In the planet's frame of reference, time was passing tens of millions of times faster than in here, like blood seeping out of her heart. It would be 18,903,729 years from the perspective of the outside before they would again set foot on Planet Blue. Part 2. The Black Domain Era Sheng Xin and Guan Yi Fan awoke from their hibernation about 16 days later from their perspective. The neural computers on both the shuttle and Hunter have booted by this time and managed to establish contact with each other. Because of the fact that they were still in a reduced light speed region, they could not use fusion drives, because within such a region, they would put out too little power. The shuttle and the ship, however, were both equipped with antimatter drives, designed specifically for use within reduced light speed regions. The specific human society who built the ship and the shuttle had put great effort into developing such technologies. The reason was not simply in case one of their vessels encountered reduced light speed conditions, but because they were in fact planning ahead just in case their specific world would have to one day enter into a black domain to hide itself from potential exposure in the dark forest. It took about a half an hour for the antimatter system to activate. The shuttle and the ship began decelerating. Over the course of the next 20 minutes, they drop out of light speed. The hypergravity of the process forcefully presses Shang Xin and Yifan into their seats. They can see Planet Blue is now no longer blue, but instead purple. The stars in the sky appeared as lines crossing in space. This was due to the fact that because of the rupturing of the death lines, the DX3906 system was now a black domain. They saw stars as if they were seeing them from inside a black hole. All the stars in space had turned into lines of light. Sheng Xin was actually familiar with such a sight. She had seen plenty of long exposure photographs taken of the starry sky from Earth. Due to Earth's rotation, the stars in pictures all became concentric arcs of approximately the same length. 
But now the stars she saw were segments of different lengths, and aligned every which way. The longest few lines, in fact, took up almost a third of the sky. These lines crossed each other at different angles, and made space appear far more confusing and chaotic than before. The DX3906 star system was now cut off from the rest of the universe. As far as they knew, they could never leave it. But there was still the question of what now waited on the planet. A change in the sun's radiation over time had caused the vegetation of the world to adapt. This resulted in the color change of the world when viewed from space. Shangxin and Yifan could detect that the oxygen concentration of the planet was considerably higher than it had been the last time they had stepped foot on the world. The geographical structure of the planet had also significantly changed since they had last been there. Guan Yifan and Shangxin surveyed the landscape of the planet, and though it was full of life, there was no sign of human life, no trace of Tianming or his vessel. Hunter, which was still in orbit above Planet Purple, had an exceptionally powerful computer. After completing its scans, it confirmed that there were no humans on the planet whatsoever. Shangxin initially believes that maybe several tens of thousands of years have passed, but she grossly underestimated. By taking rock samples taken from the planet and measuring their atomic decay, they determined the actual length of time that had gone by. Average atomic decay dating results Error range, 0.4%. Stellar time periods lapsed, 6,177,906. Earth years lapsed, 18,903,729. They knew then that both Tianming and AA had been dead for millions of years. Sheng Xin, however, remembers what Luo Ji had done earlier in the novel. When the solar system was attacked with the dual vector foil, leading to a dimension strike causing the collapse of Earth's solar system into two dimensions, Luo Ji, who during the Crisis Era saved mankind from destruction at the hands of the alien invaders, the Trisolarans, attempted to preserve some of humanity's history on the world Pluto by carving into stone. He believed, more so than any method, that this was the most permanent. Sheng Xing commands Hunter to scan at a depth range between 20 and 30 meters. Hunter's AI was capable of recognizing language. An hour later, it brought back fragments of words which had been carved into an enormous bedrock, now buried 30 meters beneath the planet. We lived a happy life together. We give you a little. Survive the collapse inside. Go to the new. Before the death lines had ruptured, AA said that Tianming had a gift for Sheng Xin. That was the gift being referenced here. It was the gift of an entire universe. Part 3, Universe 647. Guan Yifan and Sheng Xin eventually discover the door, the gift left by Tianming. It had been left there for more than 18 million years. To call it just a door would be inaccurate. It was almost sentient. It remembered that in the beginning it had been placed next to the carved rock containing the text. In the beginning it had also had a metal frame, but that had eroded millions of years ago. It itself had no fear of erosion because it existed outside of time. When it detected the presence of humans on the surface of the world, it rose to the surface. While doing so it made no interaction with the crust, it moved through the world like a ghost. It immediately confirmed that Guan Yifan and Shang Xin were the two humans that it had been expecting. Something strange interrupted their meditation. A rectangle limbed by faint lines of light, about a man's height, hovered over the clearing like the dash section lines marked out by dragging a mouse. It moved through air, but did not go far before returning to its original position. It was possible that it had been there all along, but the outline was so faint and thin that it was invisible during daytime. Whether it was made by a force field or actual substance, there was no doubt it was the creation of intelligence. After walking through the door, Shang Xin and Guan Yifan are immersed in primordial darkness and also experience the sense of being in a time vacuum, the same as when they encountered the ruptured death lines. For a moment, time does not exist. Darkness disappeared. Time began. 
there is no appropriate expression in human language to express the moment at the start of time. To say that time began after they entered the door would be wrong because after required time. There was no time here, and thus no before or after. The time after they entered could have been shorter than a billion billionth of a second, or longer than a billion billion years. The miniature universe beyond the door was a completely enclosed world, in which the end was also the beginning. When you walk all the way to its edge, you simply return to where you started. There was a sun and a blue sky, an unplanted field with black soil, a large white house, and tiny robots attending it all. From the house, a woman walks out. Shang Xin recognizes her immediately. So fun. So Fun had been the avatar through which the Trisolarans had spoke to humanity through during the Deterrence Era. She had also been humanity's cruel dictator following the fall of that era. But this So Fun was somehow different. So Fun had only been a puppet of the Trisolarans. This version served another purpose. She was the manager of this universe, which was called Universe 647. She was essentially placed there by Tian Ming to serve Guan Yi Fan and Shang Xin. The war between Trisolaris and humankind was quite literally ancient history. It had ended millions of years ago. This entire miniature universe had been constructed with Trisolaran technology. They learned from Sofan that time moves much slower in the miniature universe than in the greater universe. Tian Ming believed that the great universe was headed for collapse essentially the Big Crunch. Following the crunch, a new Big Bang. This would create a new universe, a new Edenic Age, a universe possessing ten dimensions not degraded by life. Tian Ming had hoped that Shang Xin and Guan Yi Fan could wait within the miniature universe until the birth of the new greater universe. It was calculated that after a span of about ten years in the miniature universe, the greater universe would reach its end. The miniature universe was not actually on Planet Blue, only its entrance was. It was truly outside the greater universe, fully independent. As time goes by within the miniature universe, Shang Xin and Guan Yi Fan learn more and more about its nature, but much of it is incomprehensible to them. They don't understand how a complete ecological cycle could function in such a small sealed place. What exactly was the sun? And where did the heat of the miniature universe go given that it was a closed system? They also learned that the miniature universe cannot communicate with the greater universe, but it was possible for the mini universe to receive broadcast from the greater universe. This was possible because all the universes were in fact bubbles above a super membrane. This was something that the Trisolarans had discovered. There were other great universes beyond our own, some possessing intelligent life. Great universes had enough energy to propagate information across the supermembrane. This required an astronomical amount of energy, equivalent to the total amount of energy within an entire galaxy. As a matter of fact, the monitoring systems in Universe 647 often received messages from other great universes on the supermembrane. Some were natural phenomenon, some were messages from intelligent beings that could not be decoded but they had never received any messages from the particular great universe they had come from. After more than a year inside the miniature universe, it finally happens. They receive a message from their own universe. It is a broadcast in countless languages. All the languages of the great races throughout the universe who made their mark, among them included the languages of the Trisolarans and of the Earth. For Shang Xin and Guan Yi Fan, the Earth's languages being presented confirm that humanity had endured in the cosmos, but the content of the broadcast itself brought a grave message from a group of beings known as the Returners. A notice from the Returners. The total mass of our universe has decreased to below the critical threshold. The universe will turn from being closed to open and die a slow death in perpetual expansion. All lives and all memories will also die. Please return the mass you have taken away and send only memories to the new universe. A miniature universe could not exist without first taking matter from the greater universe. The message was clear. 
Universe 647 was one of who knows how many miniature universes constructed by humanity, the Trisolarans, and countless others, each one containing matter stolen from the greater universe. Without the return of that matter, the universe could not reset to its Edenic age. In perpetual expansion, all the galaxies would move farther and farther away from each other, until none were visible from any other. By then, standing at any point in the universe, all one would see was darkness in every direction. The stars would go out one by one, and all celestial bodies would turn into thin dust clouds. Coldness and darkness would reign over all, and the universe would become a vast, empty tomb. All civilizations and all memories would be buried in that endless tomb for eternity. Death would be eternal. In order to save the universe, the matter locked up in all of the many universes would need to be brought back. This, however, means that all the refugees fleeing the destruction of the Crunch would have to return to the greater universe as well. Shangxin and Guan Yi Fan make their decision. They will dismantle the mini universe and return to the greater universe. Within the miniature universe, they leave a quantum computer containing the entire memory of Trisolaris and the Earth, and a tiny sphere containing a fully sealed ecological system with a tiny light emitter. As long as it remained there, Universe 647 would not be a lifeless, empty, and dark world. Entering their fusion-powered vessel, they leave Universe 647 forever, into the main universe which has advanced 10 billion years. Planet Blue no longer existed. The star DX3906 had long ago vanished. It was a possibility, though they could not say for certain, that the great universe would no longer even be three-dimensional once they entered it. It was within their capabilities to move the entrance to the mini-universe elsewhere. Once they exited, they would appear somewhere else in the greater universe. What exactly they might encounter, they did not know. This is where Death's End concludes. The story is continued, however, in the spin-off novel, which was not written by Shishin Lu, but instead by Bao Shu, titled Redemption of Time. An interesting thing that Lu Shishin does at the end of this novel is set up how terrible and sad the idea of the universe endlessly expanding in darkness would be if they could not repair it. But the fact is, the continued expansion of the universe is one of the main currently accepted theories for what may happen in real life. Scientists realized a while ago that the Big Crunch was most likely not possible. The universe is expanding due to a mysterious force known as dark energy. Dark energy makes up about 70% of the universe, and we really don't know what it is. But we do know that it is causing the expansion of the universe. And we also know that the expansion is not stopping, it is in fact accelerating. Scientists say that eventually every particle in the universe will be perfectly spaced out. Because of this, gravity would have no effect, there would be no light, no movement, just endless silence and darkness. The fact that this seems to be the reality for the future of the cosmos makes this ending all the more existential. The inhabitants of the Three-Body Problem universe have a way to save themselves. We do not. I think that the ending of Death's End also presents an environmentalist metaphor. The universe is Earth. Those who have selfishly taken pieces of it and hoarded them away are ensuring its destruction. It is up to everyone to come together, make sacrifices, and return what they have taken so that everything is ultimately not destroyed. Many of the themes of this series are intriguing and terrifying, as we've discussed here, but there are also certain things about this series that just ring true. What if we could become so advanced that we start doing to the universe what we are doing to the Earth? Destroying it with war, with the careless usage of technology, draining its resources until nothing functions as it should. The metaphor here is clear. People often ask me what exactly it is that I love so much about this series. I love it because it does exactly what science fiction should do. It takes a real thing, like the fear of the outside or the human capacity for self-destruction, and it shines a new light on it. 
what would all of these very real things be like in the context of a universe full of hostile aliens? A universe with weapons that break the universe itself, and technology that leaves ruptures in space-time? This is a trilogy that kept me glued to the page all the way to the end, because I just kept asking, what's the next stage? What other potential ominous questions about the universe are going to be explored next? If a writer can do that, then I think that is very effective writing. Even though we've gotten to the end of the book, there are still more aspects of this series to explore, and I will continue to explore those aspects in videos in the future, as well as exploring the spin-off novel, Redemption of Time. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe for more Quinn's ideas. Also, check out our Patreon, as it is the best way to support this channel. Thanks so much. It is now time for Patreon questions. First question from Donovan Carr. Good day, Quinn. Keep up the great work. We know that the Trisolaran fleet changed direction once the gravitational wave transmitter was activated and determined that both Trisolaris and Earth were doomed due to Dark Force theory. Why wouldn't Trisolaris agree to work with humanity to fight slash defend against a common slash unknown enemy or pool resources to work toward a common goal such as colonizing a stable planetary system together? Seems like such a waste of resources and potentially dooming both species instead of enforced collaboration, enhancing their survival rate. Enemy Mind by Barry B. Longyear comes to mind in this regard. Okay, so when answering this question, we have to look at the themes of this particular series. And one of the biggest themes is paranoia. And I think that's one of the biggest things, too, that would have stopped something like that from working. I don't think humanity could have ever really trusted Trisolaris. At least not at that point in time. I think it would have been too early for these two civilizations to have a functioning collaboration of any kind that would have lasted long term. At this point in their existence. I think it's simply too early, and also it just does not fit the themes of the book. If this was a different kind of story, then maybe that's something that could have potentially been explored. I think this is a good time to point out, and this is true with almost every book that you will ever read, sometimes even with speculative science fiction, what happens is not necessarily what would happen in real life. The narrative unfoldings instead reflect and emphasize something that the author is trying to say specifically. They could want to explore some kind of statement about the human condition, or in some cases explore a specific emotion. When it comes to narrative structures, even in stories that are mostly meant to be viewed realistically, sometimes the theme has to take precedent. The next question is from John Stanton. Have you watched Person of Interest, Westworld, and The Periphery? I don't even know if sci-fi fans even know that all three shows by Nolan tell the story of the AI god that saves humanity from destruction. Very interesting. So to answer your question, I have not watched Person of Interest. I have not watched The Periphery. I have watched season one of Westworld. I did not consume any of the other seasons of Westworld, unfortunately. It's not that I had anything particularly against the show. I thought that season one of Westworld could have been six episodes. And I felt like for me as a, an avid science fiction fan that the show wasn't offering me anything that I hadn't seen before in a more interesting form. And that's an experience that I often have watching science fiction movies and watching science fiction television shows because books are so much more vivid and often so much more detailed. That's nothing against that show or against these other two shows. I might give them a try in the future, but at this time I have not seen them. But that concept of the AI God that saves humanity from destruction is an interesting concept. And it reminds me of a kind of a reversal, just hearing the concept reminds me of a kind of reversal of the idea of the technological singularity, which is this idea of when AI surpasses humans and bad things are implied to happen from that point on. This concept, by the sound of it, seems like the opposite, AI rising up and saving humanity from itself, kind of. Thanks for the incredible content you put out. What are your feelings on the cyberpunk subgenre? Ever plan to tackle any of the cyberpunk greats like Neuromancer, Snow Crash, and Altered Carbon the like? I've enjoyed some of these as much as Dune and would really dig to see them 
get the Quinn treatment? Well, first of all, thank you for calling cyberpunk a subgenre because I've seen people refer to cyberpunk as a genre, and I don't really see it as a genre because the only substantive difference from cyberpunk and regular science fiction is purely aesthetic, in my opinion. And it can be a pretty subtle aesthetic shift, honestly. I think there's a little bit debate about some things, whether they are cyberpunk and not cyberpunk. Anyway, to answer your question, yes, I do plan on covering Gibbons' Neuromancer at some point in the future specifically. Alright guys, that's it for the questions in this video. Thanks so much for watching.